Thanks, Gary. Well, thanks to the uh, panelists' incredible discipline. They all stayed uh, within uh, one standard of being on time. Uh, we have plenty of time to uh, take questions from the, uh, from the audience. So let me open it up. I will uh, recognize the speaker. And again, if you have a, a question that you'd like directed specifically at one of the panelists, please say so. I'm going to try to put on my, I should have brought a hat to put on. Yes, uh, Professor Swami. <laughs> I can see why you said you were blinded yesterday. I have a very old-fashioned question. So the last time I read about financial crisis, which was like a long time ago, people used to talk about the token tax. Has that disappeared from the agenda, <laughs> or is that still on the agenda? Would you like to address that to anyone in particular? Okay, Jim will uh, Jim will feel that. Well, as a Yale alumnus and student of Professor Tobin, yes, I do recall the Tobin tax, um, throwing a little sand in the wheels. Uh, it, like the issue of capital controls, it pops up and pops down. Uh, lots of money there, and you don't have to do it too much. Maybe it's a good idea. I'm not sure it's going to, if you think about it as a steady number, it's not going to change the volatility which is the issue. It may reduce somewhat the average amount, but I don't know how much that's going to be. So I don't think that's a solution for the volatility. Other questions? Uh, yeah, Olivier. As a remark uh, on the first of the third, uh, intervention, which is that we collectively, not just the IMF, all of us have no clue as to how the optimal financial system, be it national or international, should be. And therefore, we don't have much of a clue as to what financial regulation of that system should be. We understand the rough architecture, but we really have no, no good understanding of how the details should be done. Which means that we have to think of these first set of proposed reforms, whether it's Basel III or Frank Dart, as a first step. Just something has to be done, this looks better than what we have. But we have to realize that on the other side, there is a very smart set of actors who basically are going to look into it and find all kinds of regulatory arbitrage opportunities which they are going to exploit, which are going to show that the first step was not great. This is going to lead to a second step with yet more implications. And I think we're going to be in that mode, realistically, uh, for a very long time. And I think that's the way we should accept uh, how it's going to go. And we have to realize that this is going to lead to an enormous amount of regulatory uncertainty uh, for a long time to come. There are other issues, national versus international and so on, but that seems very fundamental. Gary, why don't you respond to that? I think it should. Uh, Is it on? The person well, behind the person behind the curtain should take. Can care you hear of me? That. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, though I think I'm I'm a bit um, I'm a bit less pessimistic than you seem to be in what you say, because while we don't know what the optimal structure might be, we do know what gets in the way of it. We know the sources of externalities. And uh, the past crisis revealed, in my view, many of them, if not all of them. And, and yet the reforms on paper try to address them, uh, though I don't think they address this too-big-to-fail problem. Um, and, and, and I believe the too-big-to-fail problem is probably going to be with us for many, many years particularly since it seems these institutions will continue to grow faster than the economies that they're trying to serve. So if we don't tackle that issue, we're really going to be in this for a long time. And I think the Dodd-Frank reform effort took as the status quo the existence of these institutions. It said, we can't do anything about them. 
for political reasons, by the way. Mm -hmm. We can't do anything about them, so we need to impose greater capital requirements, greater liquidity requirements. We need to get them to more effectively self-monitor their activities in OTC derivatives markets, because I certainly haven't seen mm -hmm. any reform efforts there being implemented. Lots of talk, lots of disagreement between the UK and the US, never mind the rest of the world. So I don't see much progress there at all. And uh, we can't measure this at all, never mind precisely, but my judgment is we now have greater systemic risk today than we did prior to the crisis. And it's because these institutions now are not only getting bigger, they're heavily supported mm -hmm. by governments, mm -hmm. even more so than they were before. We need to tackle that problem. So that's a huge externality. We know it exists. And without making progress there, other reforms seem to be trivial to me. Gary, I thought you said you were going to be less pessimistic than Olivier. Well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take the next question. Yes. First, a comment. Citibank failed, B of A failed, Royal Bank of Scotland failed. Uh, let's get rid of the cliches. Uh, but now the question, do the three speakers agree on the sources of the four waves of financial crises we had since 1982? It seems to me there's a card in the horse pub. There's a lot of chatter about reform, but there's no, I detect no agreement on the cause of the crisis. This is like 17th century medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, downward spiral of pessimism, I think we have here. <laughs> Who would like to uh, take, uh, field that one? <laughs> well, I didn't, I showed the slide for one second. There's a lot of discussion about what caused this question, never mind the other ones. Um, but um, I think I agree with uh, Gary very much. One of the problems was these institutions really were too big to fail. And well, but uh, wait, wait, wait. No, How did they get there? Okay, and that's, that's the question. Um, now, one of the other things everyone seems to agree on, and I think we can judge this from, why did all the countries that we know of in the developing world from 95 to 2002 had crises, did not have financial sector crises in this, this period? Why is that? It seems to me there's only one thing. No toxic assets, no toxic derivatives. Now, I don't want to say anything more than what Volcker said by implica implication. The biggest financial innovation that has occurred in the last 25 years was the ATM. It wasn't toxic assets. Um, I, I, Go ahead, Gary. say something. Um, e even if you believe that um, the crisis was caused by macroeconomic policy. Right. Say the Greenspan put. Let's suppose that was the major cause of the imbalances that ultimately led to systemic risk. Every large bank around the world has a huge research staff. They understood that as well. They understood that at some point the Fed was going to change its tune or the system was going to be so much a flood with liquidity and that asset prices were just way out of whack. Being, risk was being mispriced. They were mispricing the risk, by the way. Many of them knew it, but they didn't have any incentive to get out of the trades. They wanted to be the last one out of the trade, mm -hmm. not the first one out of the trade. And why is that the case? Why do these private sector entities with profit motives stay in the game long after they think it's over. It's because they're supported by government policies. That is a fundamental cause of this crisis. That's the too big to fail problem. They are playing with depositor guaranteed funds. Mm -hmm. Even when they have to borrow in the markets, they're borrowing in markets with excess liquidity and they're mispricing the risk. They knew that they stayed in the game well after they would have closed out had they not had government guarantees. Cause of the problem. All right. Yeah, Nancy. 
So um, on this too big to fail issue, for someone who doesn't follow this, you know, daily, I find myself uh, confused between two possible alternatives to address the issue. One is to say there's some size of a bank which has any kind of government protection, or <coughs> which is too big. It's measured in terms of what, though? You know, the uh, 0.001% of the global economy, 0.05% of the domestic economy. The alternative is it has more to do with the vulgar rule and the um, the, the products, the question of whether the bank is you know, a commercial bank or an investment bank and not able to do derivatives. So that, i just like to understand if any of you have sort of alternatives on that. Let me ask one other question, question on the floor. When Rex was talking about warranted policies, I was wishing, and maybe you can do it now, give us an example. <coughs> When the IMF came down hard on Malaysia in uh, 1998 or whatever it was, I think the IMF came down hard, or at least publicly, it, it, the position of capital controls was uh, condemned, or at least uh, complained that. Um, was, it, was that unwarranted then, what Malaysia did? And, and now, you know, when Brazil <coughs> Responds to the appreciation of its exchange rate. Uh, what it's doing or not doing is it warranted, or I mean, what is the metric by which the IMF or any outside third-party observer? What's the metric used? Because of course, you know, this is sort of like um, what developing countries complain about well, that the IMF has its positions. But uh, it's rather arbitrary in terms of how much it complains, depending on uh, the power or the size of the economy and, and whether it, the, the country has to listen or not. So, so first, the bank or? let's have Rex go first and tell us about warranted. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so first to, to clarify on, on the Malaysia example. Um, that was not the sense in which I was using the term unwarranted. And I think I, I, my, my personal view about the Malaysia example was that um, the capital controls that they imposed were essentially on outflows and they were closing the, the stable door after the, you know, the, the, the horse had bolted. So it was neither here nor there. Uh, um, well, wait, wait. So that's bad. Out, any, uh, no, I, I, so I, I'm not saying that any uh, control and outflows are bad. In some circumstances, they are the, that, that's your only option. Right? I'm just saying that in the Malaysian case, it, the issue was almost moot. I mean, the, most of the capital that was going to flee had fled. So it was pointless in that sense. When I was say, using the word warranted, what I mean is um, if we think about the global configuration of exchange rates, you know, say, if we think, say, China is, is excessively weak. Right? So we should not be using controls to support uh, that type of exchange rate configuration. And it could be both on the weakness side and, and on the excessive strength side. Now, as a technical matter, it's very hard to prove that one country's exchange rate is undervalued and you know, there are different metrics and there's a lot of uncertainty around those estimates. But as long as we could agree on whether something is undervalued or overvalued, uh, that's what I mean by warranted versus unwarranted. If you could keep your answer really brief, Gary, so there's one last question I want to get to before we adjourn. Okay. So if you just give us a number, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I assume that when you said bank, you meant an institution that took deposits and made loans. Their size is not really a problem. Size becomes a problem when a bank is not just a bank. It's doing investment banking. It has a huge over-the-counter derivatives market managing its liquidity. Um, so in that case, so the combination of size and complexity 
how it's integrated into the financial system is very important. That gets around to the Volcker rule, because the Volcker rule tries to get out of this dilemma of having within one institution both a bank and a casino. And he wants to put a firewall between those two. <laughs> Let the casino go bust without impinging on the viability of the bank. I do want to make time for one last question from one of our CDE fellows down here. Edson, do you still have your question? Wait. Wait. Uh, well, my, my question is for Professor Peach. I was saying, like, uh, in this presentation, that you uh, in managing uh, capital inflows, we should refer to uh, think of uh, tightening like fiscal policy or lowering interest rates and not thinking about the recession or reserve accumulation. My, my question is, in Mozambique, where I'm from, and by the many developing countries, has been, has been receiving huge capital inflows and we have the high interest rate and the tightening fiscal policy to control inflation. So we all already have it. So our main policy to manage the capital flows has been like uh, stabilization and accumulation of pressure. Accumulation of pressure because in certain extent we don't have the capacity of, uh, of managing the capital inflows and we don't have the absorption capacity. So should it make sense if it, uh, stabilization and accumulation doesn't make it's not a good policy. Would it make sense to think about capital control? Um, Sounds like a question for Rex. Yes. Yep. <laughs> uh, very briefly. Very briefly. Very briefly. Time. So first, um, maybe I went through this too fast. Uh, I did not say that you should not accumulate reserves. Uh, so that is uh, one of the, the policy options. Um, I was saying you should not do this when, when you're offsetting warranted adjustment. Uh, and second, um, indeed, if, uh, if, if those macro policy tools have been exhausted, then controls might be the, the, the only option that, that you would, you'd consider. Okay, with that, I'm afraid uh, if we go any farther, Jerry is going to uh, come out here and start uh, beating me up. So uh, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank the panelists. And perhaps if there are any questions that you'd like to put to them, find them during the coffee break. And I'm sure they'd be happy to answer them. Thank you once again, guys. Thank you.